Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I am the director of the Ashland Public Library. I'm thrilled to be here with Gil Asakawa. Um, Asakawa. Yes, I practiced it. I'm good. <laughs> Talking about um, Pop Goes the Culture, all about Asian Americans and pop culture throughout history. And I'm so excited about this because I think that um, it's AAPI month and it's a great way to end it out and talking about something that, you know, we all enjoy, but kind of like wonder, you know, do we see ourselves in pop culture and the hist in, um, in cinema and, and all of that and TV. So I'm really interested in this whole topic. Um, so before I get started, I just want to say a couple things. One is that um, I'd like to thank the friends of the Ashland Library who support all of our programming. We couldn't do it without them. Also, um, we are partnering with several libraries to bring this program to you. The Brookline Library, Cary Memorial in Lexington, Maynard, Norwood, Somerville, and Wayland. And I always say that when libraries get together, we are super powerful and somewhat magical. So I'm really excited about that. Um, we will be taking questions after Gil's um, presentation. So feel free to put your questions in the q and I'll be paying attention to that. And if you have anything that you would like to chat about, Please put your comments and any tech issues in the in the um, chat, including where you're coming from and how you heard about this program. So, um, you know, or anything that you that you think would be relevant to our conversation, I'll be paying attention to that too. In case there's anything that I need to let Gil know about. So, without further ado, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Gil. Um, what I found really interesting about Gil is that he's a journalist, editor, author, and blogger who covers Japan, Japanese American, Asian American, and Pacific Islander cultural and social justice issues. But since we started planning this program, I've been following Gil on Facebook and he is an amazing chef. He is, he's always posting foods and like the most uh, pictures of the most amazing foods. And I was just like, are you a chef? Are you a foodie? Tell me more. Tell us more about you, Gil, and let's get started. I, uh, I like to eat, what can I say? <laughs> this uh, pandemic has been really bad for me because it's not just a pandemic five or 10. I've gained a lot and I, I can feel it and I can see it. But I, I do love to cook and I do love to eat. And, uh, you know, we've gotten in, my wife and I've gotten used to going out and taking out food and bringing it back home and and watching watching endless hours of Netflix <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. Amazon yeah. Prime. Uh, while we eat. So, um, the, yeah, that's that's what I do. I am a journalist. I was a music critic, a music editor for, what, 15 years. <clears throat> and then I was pretty early on in the internet thing. Uh, went to work for online uh, operations. I worked for AOL uh, very early and uh, have run newspaper websites uh, for newspaper companies. And so I've been kind of on the edge of tech and writing and stuff. I wrote a book about being Japanese American. Um, and earlier in 1991, I had a book called The Toy Book that I co-authored with a friend about the toys of the baby boom era. I bet none of the Massachusetts Library have it, but it was published by Alfred Knopf. So it was a real publisher and uh, it was a pretty fun book, History of of toys of the baby boom generation. Then I have a book coming out this fall, which fits my foodie identity. Uh, it's called Tabemasho, which means let's eat in Japanese. And uh, it's subtitled, uh, The Tasty History of Japanese Food in America. It's about how, when I was a kid and my family first moved to the US from Japan, kids used to tease me and say, ooh, you, you eat that, that raw fish stuff that's gross and uh, i bet those kids um who are now my age their grandkids probably go to the grocery store and buy sushi not very good sushi but they eat sushi you know a couple times a week so uh it's interesting to see how japanese food like japanese culture has um, become embraced over the years in the united states and so that's what this presentation is about pop goes to culture uh in looking back you know i need to give you a little bit of history first but uh asians have been uh kind of the subject of american pop culture since the start so uh it's been a long time 
a uh, few Filipino sailors ended up uh, in the swamps of Louisiana, believe it or not. And they started a settlement there in the 1700s. Uh, and then a, a Japanese um, teenager famously got shipwrecked and then rescued by a, a whaler from Massachusetts, as it happens. And, um, and he was educated in the US and, and then he went back to Japan and promptly got thrown into jail because you weren't supposed to leave Japan back then. Uh, but then once the Americans came to Japan, John Manjiro, that was his Americanized name, uh, became super in demand by the government and was actually made a, uh, an honorary samurai because he helped in the negotiations with the United States when the U US first forced Japan to open. But the real story of Asians in America starts first with the Chinese because they were the first immigrant group to come you know, in, in large numbers in 1849 uh, because of the San Francisco gold rush. They came to make money, send it back home, and then go back to China as rich men. Didn't quite always work that way. These are um, typical depictions from the American media at the time. Uh, you see the, uh, uh, the yellow peril, the yellow terror and all his glory um, you know, that he would come and, and rape and murder and burn down your property and, and uh, look scary and had the cue, his hair. The photo on the uh, photo, the image on the right is a lithograph that ran in newspapers from an 1880 anti-Chinese race riot in downtown Denver, where I live. And um, it was on October 31st, 1880. And the Chinatown district was burned down. Uh, the Chinese did return and rebuild it, and were still in the in that area neighborhood by like the 1950s even. Uh, but now it's become this really hip area called Lower Downtown or Lodo, and it's right by Coors Field where the Colorado Rockies, where Colorado Rockies play uh, baseball. So, um, but even before the immigrant wave. The first well-known Chinese was a woman, a girl, really, named Efang Moi. Uh, she was basically purchased and brought to the U.S. in uh, 1834 as a 14-year-old. She was sold to a pair of businessmen who displayed her like a zoo animal or a, a circus freak show uh, display. And uh, people would pay money to see her. And uh, she was assigned a, uh, 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 an interpreter who could speak English named Atong. And uh, she was displayed for several decades uh, until the 1850s. There are newspaper articles and ads of her uh, being uh, advertised as the Chinese lady. And, um, you know, uh, she had her, her feet were bound because she came from an upper class family in China. You have to wonder what her real story was. Uh, Asian American playwright named Lloyd Su uh, wrote a, a play about her called The Chinese Lady. It's actually played all over the US. I think it premiered in Boston, actually. And um, it, you know, yeah, it's, it premiered in Pittsfield, Massachusetts in 2018. And it's coming to Denver uh, this fall, and I can hardly wait to uh, to see it. It looks fascinating. But yeah, she was the first. She was like a star uh, in the United States. A lot of people knew about her. Japan, after it was opened up uh, in the 1860s and became kind of you know modernizing, everything was about becoming American, becoming Westernized, uh, and uh, as the became known in the West, Japan was also very exotic, like that Chinese lady. And uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, the British uh, uh, operetta uh, writers, uh, created the Mikado, which is a stupid play uh, that takes place in Japan in a town they call Titipu. And its characters have stupid names like Nankipu and Yum Yum. 
Uh, and it's still a very popular piece of Gilbert and Sullivan's repertory. And um, this is a photograph from the University of Denver's Newman Center uh, for a touring Gilbert and Sullivan theatrical production of uh, the Mikado. And, you know, all the characters are Caucasian in yellow face and wearing kind of uh, very exaggerated costumes. They talk in exaggerated um, accents. It's just so obnoxious. I, I, this is the one thing that I would urge uh, theaters to never perform again because it's just problematic. You know, things like New Saigon also pro problematic about its portrayal of um, the end of the Vietnam War. But A, it makes a ton of money for theaters across the country. And, and B, you can mitigate some of that with education about what actually happened in the Vietnam War. Um, but this exoticism, you know, had a flip side, which is that impressionist artists in France all fell in love with uh, Japanese art that they found amazingly as wrapping paper for things that were sent to Europe. And so a lot of the famous woodblock prints that we all know from Japan were actually uh, sent with uh, as packaging <laughs> for gifts uh, for, for what were considered real gifts. And the uh, painters in France just fell in love with the stuff. And so Impressionism was born and inspired by Japanese art. When Hollywood came to be, and silent movies uh, uh, were all the rage. Two of the biggest stars in Hollywood were Asian American. Anna Mae Wong was born in Los Angeles. Born, remember that, she was born in Los Angeles. She was an American citizen by birth. Seshu Hayakawa was born in Japan, but came to Hollywood because he wanted to be a movie star. And he had those smoldering good looks like, like a Rudolph Valentino. And so both of them were quite popular. They were the superstars of their day uh, in silent movies. Uh, Anna Mae Wong was even, um, she was the first famous woman to take on the flapper look in the 1920s before the depression and was voted the world's best dressed woman in 1934, I think in Cosmopolitan magazine, in, a, in one of the big American magazines. Uh, she left for Europe when she got frustrated that she was only getting roles as kind of the exotic dragon lady when she could do so much more. And remember, she's American, so she, she could speak English. Seshi Hayakawa had to learn English, but he played all those romantic leads uh, that like Rud Rudolph Valentino became famous for. And the unfortunate thing is that within a few short years, um, Asians were not popular. So this is what happened, right? 1941, Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, we go to war. Uh, the Japanese became the yellow peril, which the Chinese had been called, you know, just like 50 years before. Um, this, this, for these two here, uh, the first two images are from a Life magazine article, how to tell Japs from Chinese on December 28, I wanna say December 27th, 1941, just several weeks after Pearl Harbor was bombed. And, uh, you know, that the Japanese has an earthy yellow complexion and less frequent epithantic folds on uh, epicanthic folds on their eyes and a flatter nose. The Chinese have parchment yellow complexion and more frequent folds in their eyes and a higher bridge on their nose. I mean, these are just really bizarre assumptions. This uh, on the right is uh, this uh, propaganda poster uh, about Tojo, very happy, uh, displays several things that are very popular depictions of Asians during this era. First is the Asian with a sallow, weird complexion, the animal teeth, 
and the uh, exaggerated slanty eyes, and then even down to the typography, Tojo, Veli Happy, that's wonton font, which to this day, when I see it, it makes my stomach go, ah, because I think it's um, an insensitive uh, and racist font. It's, it's, a, it's a stereotype of what Westerners think Asian writing looks like. In the middle here is our old friend, Dr. Seuss, um, who did a whole bunch of propaganda cartoons for the US government. Uh, and he depicted, you know, Nazis and, and Italians, but he didn't turn them into caricatures, uh, like racial caricatures. Uh, if he did uh, Nazis, it was most often an image of Hitler, because he was he's a caricature, I guess. Um, all his illustrations of Japanese were like this, buck tooth. Uh, slanty eyes, and he would have images of like hundreds of Japanese in line for something, and they would all be exactly the same. And after the war, because he worked for the State Department and was uh, directed films, uh, documentary films during the war effort. And after the war, he was sent to Hiroshima to document the rebuilding of the city from the atomic bomb. And he actually made very, very close friends with a Japanese uh, uh, in Kyoto, Japan, and his first big hit book, children's book after the war was Horton Hears a Who, which I'm sure we've all read. It's in the libraries. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a great book about how this elephant hears the voices of tiny people on a, on a like a grain of sand on a, on a rock. And, uh, the moral of the story is that there are creatures everywhere and that they're all worth saving. Uh, something he learned, I think, from being in Hiroshima. And this book is dedicated for my great friend, Mitsuki Nakamura of Kyoto, Japan. So um, when I first found out about all these propaganda images, I got really mad about Dr. Seuss. And uh, when I found this dedication in Horton Hears a Who, I thought, okay, he's cool. He, uh, he understands. Uh, and he never did like a racial stereotype of, uh, of Asians again after that. As far as Hollywood, uh, for decades, Asians were whitewashed uh, with yellow face. Uh, Catherine Hepburn in 1944 uh, had her ta eyes taped back and, and um, her complexion was made darker. Marlon Brando in Tea House for the August Moon in 1956, which is weird because the very next year in 1957, uh, his movie Sayonara came out. And uh, it was a wonderful film, a little long. It's almost three hours long, I think. But he plays an Air Force um, uh, captain, lieutenant, uh, in station in Japan who, who falls in love with the Japanese during the Korean War. And, and so it's weird to me that he was able to do this ice tape back, bad accented. He played an Okinawan man in Tea House of the August Moon. And, uh, and then the next year he releases Sayonara, which was a very poignant um, love story uh, set during the Korean War. Mickey Rooney ruined Breakfast at Tiffany's, which would otherwise be a wonderful, great movie. And it was for a lot of people. But that, when I first saw this, um, Mickey Rooney is in, in just a couple of, of scenes. And he plays a pervert Japanese photographer with exaggerated teeth and exaggerated accent. And he squints and he's got these glasses. And he's a pervert. He wants to take pictures of Audrey Hepburn um, Holly Go Lightly, and he, he says, Holly Go, music Go Lightly, and it's just disgusting, and I, I have the DVD, uh, I, I can't watch it. Um, Jerry Lewis, who also made some great movies set in Japan, where he plays sensitive characters um, who are, uh, who don't stereotype Japanese, well, he played somewhere he did stereotype Japanese, but um, in this this movie is from 1980. Can you imagine? It's not even that long ago. And he's 
doing this, um, comedian Jerry Lewis. Uh, just such a disappointment to see this all the time. Here's yellow face, past and I guess sort of present, and, you know, not anymore. Warner Oland was one of two different white men who played Charlie Chan in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, Yul Brenner, a uh, pretty good actor, but in The King and I, he played the King of Siam or Thailand, and he was totally bronzed. And uh, really, a, when I think about it, it's a weird role for him to play, but he, he made a big you know, name with it. And then um, David Carradine, of course, played Kung Fu, the TV series in the 1970s, which to be fair, helped Chinese martial arts, Kung Fu become very popular. But he was a, a white man uh, whose excuse for being in the show is that he was a half blood, right? He was a half breed, half Chinese and half white. And that was the excuse uh, for him playing this role. Noah Ringer in the 2010 version of The Last Airbender was roundly criticized for being a, a white kid who played this kind of very famous Japanese um, anime character and manga character uh, and uh, you know there's lots of Asian characters and Alaska Native characters and most of the characters in this movie from 2010 um, were played by uh, white actors. Uh, there is a new version coming uh, so I'm looking forward to that this year actually uh, with Tamlin Tomitas in it and um, um, it's produced and Maggie Q. Uh, oh, he's Maggie Q is not in it, but um, no, Daniel Day Kim is in it. Albert Kim, who's not related to Daniel Day, but he is a TV producer and writer for shows like Leverage and Sleepy Hollow. He's behind this new version of Airbender coming out. And he said he wanted to do this and do it right for his kids. So they wouldn't, you know, have to watch a bad version of The Last Airbender. Um, there are stereotypes on stage as well, obviously. Here's a, a, a poster from the original version of The Mikado by Gilbert and Sullivan. Again, white women in kind of goofy looking kimonos acting like they think Japanese people would act. Madama Butterfly, Puccini's famous um, opera, is a beautiful piece of work, but it's based on the racist notion that uh, uh, an American, <coughs> excuse me, uh, American soldier would go to Japan in the late 1800s and, uh, and fall in love with a woman and then leave to go back to the US and doesn't know that she got pregnant. And when he comes back, he comes back with his wife from America. And um, spoiler alert, the wood with the woman, Chocho, Chocho san, uh, Chocho means butterfly in Japanese or moth, uh, Chocho. So her character's name is Chocho in the play, in the opera. And um, Chocho kills herself, spoiler alert. Uh, Miss Saigon is actually a modernized version of the same story. Um, so these stereotypes continue to persist. Uh, and what's interesting, Puccini wrote Madama Butterfly as a criticism of American imperialism of the late 1800s. And, um, you know, he may have done it that way, but the, what people remember is the love story and the woman killing herself and uh, what a tragedy that is. And uh, uh, it plays up the stereotype of the um, sexually available Asian woman. You know, if you've ever seen, um, um, what's the Vietnam War movie? My mind just went blank. Well, you know, where the uh, prostitute in Saigon goes, we love you long time. and. Uh, it's just disgusting how how uh, these stereotypes still persist. There was a pretty good representation 
of Japan in uh, 1976. Pacific Overtures was a Broadway musical with uh, music and lyrics by the late Stephen Sondheim, who just died last year. And I remember seeing this on Broadway. It starred Mako, the Japanese American actor. Uh, and uh, and it was pretty cool. It was kind of a fictionalized version of the opening of Japan by the United States. And it was done as a kind of a tribute to Kabuki theater, the historic uh, form of theater in Japan. And, and you could tell that Sondheim and the producers went out of their way to really study how Japan did Kabuki theater, because none of that the offhand um, stereotypes of the Mikado uh, came through in Pacific Overtures. It's been done over the years in small productions uh, and in, in uh, I think in London and, uh, and, in, and also on Broadway again later. But uh, it, I was glad that I got to, to see it uh, in its original version. George Takei performed in the, in the, in the main role that Mako did uh, a couple of decades earlier uh, in 2017. So first, I do want to play a little bit of commercials that involved um, Asians. Back to present ancient Chinese pantomime just for fun of it, Jello tonight. Back to present small Chinese Thai baby waiting for dessert. Chinese mother, bling baby, jello, famous Western delicacy. Poor Chinese baby. He unable to tell if this jello is strawberry, raspberry, jelly, orange, lemon, lime, apple, black raspberry, black jelly, or grape. Jello come in all ten flavors. Poor Chinese baby. But Chinese mother, bling baby, great Western invention, spoon. Spoon was invented for eating jello. Baby fine, this is grape jello. Deep, dark, delicious new flavor. Okay. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> this is how Asians were perceived in mainstream media, TV commercials in the early 1960s. Um, here's another one from the late 1960s, early 1970s, which I like much better for several reasons, and I'll go into that. How do you get shirts so clean, Mr. Lee? Ancient Chinese secret. My husband, some hot shot. Here's his ancient Chinese secret, Calgon. Calgon's two water softeners soften wash water so detergents clean better. In hardest water, Calgon helps detergents get laundry up to 30% cleaner. We need more Calgon. Ancient Chinese <laughs> secret, huh? Calgon helps detergents get laundry up to 30% cleaner. Okay, when I was like um, a kid, and I guess this would have been like middle school, pre-high school, um, we used to go around saying ancient Chinese secret, huh? Because of this commercial. It's a turning point for Asians and commercials, though it's taken a long time uh, for Asians to be featured this way. Again, first of all, it's a stereotype that Chinese run laundries. In China, the people aren't known for some special magic in washing clothes and ironing them. For those of you who may only think of dry cleaners, Chinese laundries were a thing well into the 1980s. That's because in the 1800s, when Chinese first came to America, they were prevented from doing so many kinds of jobs or own businesses, except for restaurants that serve other Chinese. But one business open to them was laundry. This 1970s couple were unique though, because they don't have any Chinese accent like in the Jell-O commercial. That's because a woman who was Japanese American refused to do the commercial unless she could speak in, a, in her regular voice, no accent. And um, so they allowed her to do that. And so although it's a stereotypical situation, and there were, I think I saw a number, I think there were like 500 Chinese laundries in um, Eastern Massachusetts, you know, between Boston and Lowell uh, at one point in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, so this, it was a 
it was a thing. And, um, uh, but this commercial didn't have to have Chinese accents to make its point. And I think that's just um, really pretty cool that they got to do it this way. And here's another one, last one I'll play, and it's a short one. <laughs> what are you doing? Art class. It's abstract expressionism. <laughs> When you start with a better hot dog from Oscar Mayer, you can do no wrong. It's all for the love of hot dog. <laughs> okay, so um, I love this because I went to art school. I did go to art school. I have a BFA in painting, and it is abstract expressionism. It's it's Jackson Pollock done <laughs> with ketchup and mustard on hot dogs. Uh, so I th <laughs> I find it hilarious. And again, these the two Asian actors in this commercial have no accent, right? They're, it's an American family. The other important thing is that they're a mixed race American family, which is now much more the norm than it used to be. Uh, little known fact, the Japanese American population um, since the 1970s, Japanese have had the highest outmarriage rate uh, of any Asian population in the United States. That means we'll marry anybody but a Japanese person. Um, and there are lots of trauma related reasons from the World War II incarceration that led to that starting in the 1970s. Um, so just something to think about. Um, oops. Okay, there was one Japanese American actor, one of the rarities uh, in Hollywood was that an Asian uh, actor, male actor, would kiss a white co star. And um, James Shigeta, good looking guy, he got to kiss co star Victoria Shaw in the noir film The Crimson Kimono, which was entirely shot in. Los Angeles' little Tokyo area. It's cool to, to, uh, to think that it was done there. Uh, probably not far from where James Shigeta lived, who knows? Um, but it's a pretty, pretty good movie. And if you get a chance to see The Crimson Kimono, I recommend it highly. If you like, you know, the Maltese Falcon kind of era of noir detective uh, films, this fits right in all the Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett films. This fits right in there. Uh, so I thought it was great that uh, in 1959, James Shigeta was allowed to kiss a Caucasian woman on screen. And uh, I bet you anything that, that room fulls of, of, of people watching it in Little Tokyo cheered when he did that. Um, so, I grew up, because I was born in Tokyo, I grew up with early anime in Japan. I even still have an Ultraman right here in my office that I hang from my lamp, desk lamp. Um, but, you know, we, we had Eighth Man, we had um, a Speed Racer, uh, we had um, uh, Adam Boy, uh, Tetsu, Tetsuan Atomu was his name in Japan, which I watched in black and white before my family moved to the States. And I started seeing it in color and dubbed into English. And then Ultraman, and on the right here, it's uh, Tetsujin Niju Hachigo, which is uh, Metal Man number 28. He was a robot. And I don't, you know, Japan has always loved robot. Eights Man was a robot. You know, uh, Adam Boy is a robot, so, or Astro Boy was a robot. And, uh, but yeah, we just, Japanese have always been infatuated with robots and aliens. Um, so early anime also helped break down some cultural barriers because young people in the US, when I, my family moved to the States in 1966 and I was eight years old, I start to see these things all over American TV in the afternoons, like Kimba the White Lion, uh, a, a Japanese anime 
that uh, that Disney totally ripped off to make the Lion King. I think they even had to admit that at some point in a uh, legal decision, uh, like 15 years ago. Uh, so things like this really help break down barriers and introduce the idea of um, foreign culture in the United States. In the 50s and 60s, we started being seen, but mostly in bit roles, like uh, Victor Sen Young uh, was in Bonanza from 1959 to 1973. Uh, if you ever watched that Western, it was about the Cartwright family. And uh, it was amazing that the show lasted 14 years. And uh, Victor Sen Young played Hop Singh, the camp cook, uh, the entire time. And he was also in a bunch of Charlie Chan films. He made 11 Charlie Chan films between 1938 and 1942. That's a lot of output uh, as uh, he played number two son. Uh, and then uh, in, in McHale's Navy, uh, Yoshio Yoda played Takeo Fujiwara, the POW. He's right here on the right of this picture uh, with Ernest Borgnine and uh, you know, all the Tim Conway. Uh, and um, he was, the, his nickname was Fuji and he had big POW on the back and he was basically treated as a pet, a mascot for this group of, of uh, uh, PT boat crew. And then um, here in Mrs. Livingston, uh, the courtship of Eddie's father was a TV show starring Bill Bixby and Brandon Cruz and Miyoshi Umeki played Mrs. Livingston. And I don't know why her name was Mrs. Livingston. Uh, well, she probably was married to a returning GI you know, after World War II and, and uh, was widowed or something. But uh, Mrs. Livingston was played by Miyoshi Umeki who was already at that time a very famous Japanese singer a recording star and a film star. And she also was in some other films, um, including the Flower Drum Song in 1961. And she played, uh, excuse me, why do people call me when I'm on a Zoom? Um, but she played uh, uh, the love interest uh, in Sayonara. In, uh, in 1957. So that's how long of a career that she had. And she played kind of a nanny maid uh, in this uh, Courtship of Eddie's Father show. And uh, let's see, what else? Uh, oh, yeah, Sulu, Star Trek. George Takei has kind of become the most famous uh, Asian American actor of his generation. He was born in 1937. He was in an incarceration camp during World War II. And he made a Broadway musical out of that experience called Allegiance, which I was fortunate enough to see on Broadway when I saw a production in LA. I've seen the, the, the Broadway version that was filmed and released in movie theaters a couple of times. And then a few years ago, he even published that story uh, as a uh, graphic novel called They Called Us Enemy. And uh, he's still at it. You know, he's a spokesperson for the Asian American community, uh, Japanese American community, the gay community. He's like a living example of diversity. He's a walking, talking Mr. Diversity. He's a cool guy, too. I've, got, I've met him and got to, to interview him. Uh, but by the late 60s, the dude was Bruce Lee, right? On the left, that's... Uh, kind of a bad TV show called The Green Hornet, where Bruce Lee was hired to be the chauffeur for The Green Hornet. And that's where he first introduced Kung Fu to American audiences. And on the right is a picture from his 1970s output. He died early. Uh, he accidentally was uh, uh, killed when he dared somebody to punch him. And, you know, it's kind of like uh, uh, Harry Houdini who uh, also died tragically in an accident that was kind of dumb. And, um, but yeah, he, he, he was uh, killed and just before his, his just after uh, Enter the Dragon, his first big Hollywood film, instead of making low budget films in Hong Kong, 
uh, he did uh, Enter the Dragon. I remember seeing it when I was in high school and it was amazing to see this guy go and kick butt all over the place and, uh, and, and be a hero of a movie. Uh, and uh, he's had a lasting impact, Bruce Lee has, on kind of the culture of Asians in America. In the 1970s and 80s, we had more visibility uh, Jack Su, who, uh, whose name is actually Jack Suzuki, he changed it to De Jack Su after uh, when he first tried to, to work in Hollywood, because in the 50s, a producer said, change your name to, to uh, Su instead of Suzuki, because nobody's going to hire a Jap. Um, by the 70s, he was a, a regular on the TV show Barney Miller, a, a sitcom, Pat Morita, was in Happy Days uh, <laughs> as the uh, the cafe owner and uh, in uh, the Karate Kid franchise um, with uh, Ralph Macchio and Tamlin Tomita, who when she made Karate Kid Two, which is uh, which takes place in Okinawa, she is Okinawan and Japanese and Hawaiian, I think, and um, uh, she was just seventeen had just been crowned Miss uh, Nisei Queen in Little Tokyo when she got the role in uh, Karate Kid 2. But Pat Morita was, you know, um, wax on, wax off. He has uh, created a, a character that people remember uh, for decades. And he's still remembered in the TV series Cobra, Cobra Kai, uh, where he's shown uh, even though he passed away actually a few years ago. Um, but, uh, and then Robert Ito was uh, uh, the assistant to Quincy the, uh, um, in, in the Los Angeles morgue to Jack Klugman, crusty boss. And these are templates for today from Hollywood. These are Asian American productions that really have had a lasting impact Everybody knows the Joy Luck Club. Um, if you've never seen it, rent it, have, some, have a box of Kleenex nearby. It's really, uh, it stars an almost entirely Asian American cast, um, including Tamlin Tomita's in there. Uh, it's about a Chinese group of Chinese friends, Chinese American friends, and their families' immigration stories. And um, it's really, uh, uh, a beautiful film and, and really influential. And a lot of the stars in it have gone on to do great things. Uh, Saving Face is a much less known uh, film. It's, it stars Joan Chen, who is still working, Lin Chen, who is still working, and Michelle Kruzik. <laughs> Gosh, uh, she ended up being in the uh, uh, Superman uh, TV show for years and then uh, Beauty and the Beast. But um, Saving Face is about a, uh, a lesbian relationship and how you deal with uh, diverse, that kind of diversity uh, within the context of a strict Asian upbringing. So uh, that was in 2004. Joy Luck Club was in uh, 1993 and both have had lasting influence. Uh, I think on our culture, uh, Asians were represented by Disney uh, in 1998. Mulan was a pretty good, fun telling of a Chinese historical myth story. And um, I know I still meet young Asian Americans, like in their 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, who say they remember this movie that really shaped them because it shows you know a strong uh, woman character uh, in the Chinese tradition and then the uh, the uh, live action version was more historically accurate and probably not as inspirational but that came out in 2020 and it was pretty good if you have Disney plus you should look that up the first glimpse of reality for Asian Americans on TV was not 
really very good. Margaret Cho starred in All American Family. Uh, the cast was Japanese American, Korean American, Chinese American, and it suffered from producers who didn't really know what they wanted and didn't really believe in Asian Americans to tell their own story. So at one point they told, you know, this is supposed to be like the Cosby show, which brought Black America to mainstream America and say, look, see, look, we have this cool black family, they're middle class, upper middle class, and they have the same kind of problems as everybody else. This tried to be that for Asian Americans and it failed because at one point they told Margaret Cho she wasn't Asian enough and they hired a coach to help her be more Asian. Uh, it got canceled. After one season, I have the season in a box set of DVDs. And after the season, she had a mental breakdown and uh, eventually went back to her stand up comedy routine, which became even more raunchy than it used to be. And so, like, she ended up like tattooing her entire body and becoming very alternative and, uh, uh, and in your face as well. And now she's kind of become the kind of the sage old spokesperson of the Asian American Hollywood community, which is kind of interesting that she has uh, kind of uh, attained a level of respect that she wasn't given back then. Okay, so now Asians are included without accents in the 90s and the 2000s, in the Hawaii Five-0, uh, Grace Park, Daniel Day Kim, they left the series when they found out they, they were making like half of what the two white stars were making and they were just as important. Uh, and then we have uh, Michaela Conlon from Bones. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, all these other from Glee, uh, Heroes, Nikita was Nikita and, and uh, um, uh, what's this movie, this series here, uh, Survivor, uh, not Survivor, uh, next Survivor, she, she, she played the, an assistant to the president, and uh, so she, this is Maggie Chu, and she's, she was also in a, a Die Hard movie, she's done really great, uh, Moon Blood Good, uh, these are all really faces that have become familiar, in the US kind of the mainstream mindset. And then things got better and better. You know, we, we have, uh, you know, uh, all these TV shows that featured Asians, uh, sometimes two Asians. <laughs> and here's Michelle Kruzek. And this is uh, Fresh Off the Boat, ended up being one of the most influential TV shows um, because it really was what, proved that an Asian American family sitcom could be successful. And um, it, it accomplished what All American Girl could not. So kudos to them. Randall Park is still um, quite popular. And 2018 was the tipping point, I think, where Crazy, Crazy Rich Asians came out Kim's Convenience, which is a Canadian broadcasting show, uh, network show, uh, about a Korean Canadian convenience store in uh, the suburbs of Toronto. And then Killing Eve was uh, really a, such a different kind of a crime show that Sandra O oh won an Emmy. And she thanked her parents in Korean on this international broadcast, which I thought was so cool. Crazy Rich Asians was a big hit movie. Nobody expected that. And it proved that you can make a Hollywood movie and have, you know, with Asians, almost entirely an Asian crew, I mean, a cast, and have non-Asians come and see it. Oh, my word. What a, what a concept. Always Be My ba Maybe was a Netflix film that uh, took that another step further. 
Asian Americans brought rom-coms back, romantic comedies, uh, because they'd been like not popular for years and years. Um, but uh, this one caught on and it brought everybody back to um, appreciating not just romantic comedies, but Asian Americans again, uh, it was like the number one film on Netflix for a long time. And it proved again that an, uh, a plot, a story centered around Asian Americans could be popular with non-Asian audiences. These, this is the next generation of Asian Americans on screen. So to all the boys I've loved before, there's three, or is it four now, movies on Netflix uh, about... Um, uh, about this high school student or started as a high school student who was uh, having a, had a crush on lots of, girl, of guys in, uh, in her school. And Lana Condor played Laura Jean, who has the uh, crushes. And it's a sweet, that's rom-com, but it's a sweet series of, of movies. Uh, the half of it is a uh, Cyrano de Bergerac update with a young uh, Asian American woman on the right here, uh, Ellie Chu, who's played by Leah Lewis, and she's hired by the class jock stud to write love notes to the girl he has a crush on. Problem, of course, is that Ellie has a crush on the same girl, too. Uh, and this is the second movie, two decades later, by Alice Wu, the writer and director who made Saving Face in 2004. And the fact that I think she could now write this story taking place in a high school environment um, really says a lot about how far we've come uh, as a country, I think, I hope. Uh, Never Have I Ever is, I think, about to uh, uh, drop a third season, but it's about a South Asian teen uh, played by Maitreyi Ramakrishnan who wants to have sex with the school star jock. Uh, who happens to be half Japanese, uh, but is fighting her mother's and community's values. And the second season is available on Netflix and the third is on the way, highly recommended. It's kind of an interesting insight into both high school life today and South Asian community life today. Now, here are some echoes of Kung Fu movies, bad, okay, and good. This is bad. This, <laughs> this is a Halloween costume that was on sale for several years. Uh, I went out and bought one because I collect, my wife and I collect these artifacts of racial stereotypes. Like last year, I went out and bought um, Land O'Lakes uh, eggs and butter and um, Aunt Jemima pancake mix and Aunt Jemima syrup, all things that were being taken off the shelves because they were racially um, no longer appropriate, rightfully so. Uh, this costume has not appeared in the last few years, but it was so bad that I had to go out and buy it. Uh, Kung Fu Panda, they're fun, not, not great, but they're fun. And you know they do have some references to Chinese culture and temples and you know Kung Fu and um, it's all right. I, I, I accept it. Kung Fu is a new TV show uh, that's just about to finish its second season, I guess. And um, it is an updated version of the Kung Fu from the 1970s that starred David Carradine. And I'll come back to this, uh, this in a minute here. But this is a pretty good show, a little slow at times, a little too brainy. Uh, and far-fetched sometimes, but uh, it's about a, a young woman in San Francisco who uh, has been given the gift of, of Kung Fu. This Netflix movie is called Wu Assassin. Actually, it was a series, sorry. Uh, Wu Assassin, it's a little bit too woo-woo in terms of its plot, but there's some terrific fighting. And, you know, this is, this is Bruce Lee's legacy, right? He he made Kung Fu popular. There are Kung Fu and martial arts studios 
in schools all over the U.S. now, you know, whether there's an Asian community or not. Um, it's because of Bruce Lee. In the 70s, there was a, uh, the, the R&B song, Everybody Was Kung Fu Fighting. That's how deeply Kung Fu um, embedded itself into the American psyche. And uh, this is worth a special mention because Warrior, this uh, series on Cinemax, uh, I think they've had three seasons now. This was uh, produced by um, Justin Lin, who's a very powerful now TV, I mean, a movie producer. Uh, and um, it was written and created by Shannon Lee, who is Bruce Lee's daughter. She found Bruce Lee's notes from uh, the time that he went to ABC and all these TV networks to try to get a show called Kung Fu produced about a wandering Kung Fu uh, master in the Old West in, uh, it started in San Francisco. And he got turned down by everybody. And then a year later, all of a sudden, Kung Fu, the TV series appeared with David Carradine playing the role that Bruce Lee had written for himself. So this is Shannon Lee, his daughter, uh, took his notes, his storylines, and wrote a more accurate version and a, quite frankly, more bloody and uh, modernized version of the story about 1800 San Francisco and the battles between the different Chinese tongs and the battles between the white Irish community and the Chinese community. And it's... Um, it's really good. It's it's actually really well done, uh, and uh, uh, pretty bloody, <laughs> but pretty great fight scenes. Uh, if you've paid attention to, gosh, are these all these are all Netflix. I am so sorry that I'm being a commercial for Netflix here. Squid Game, surprise hit, a Korean TV series that is just insanely weird about you know people who have to play this odd game or die. Gunpowder and Milkshake was a action film um, and uh, uh, Cowboy Bebop is based on a very popular anime from Japan. The chair spent, starred Sandra Oh as the chair of a department in a small university. Uh, it it, uh, it was actually well reviewed, but uh, kind of came and went. It's still on Netflix though, and it's worth watching. Uh, Love Hard came out last Christmas season, and it starred this Caucasian woman who has a crush and can't decide. He actually doesn't have a crush. Jimmy O Yang is a, a Asian guy who who has a crush on her, and he kind of gets his friend um, to be him on social media but it ends up with as a triangle and it's a lovely little fun film um so uh again it's it's worth it because of of uh this kind of uh just having an asian male love lead is still uh unusual current hits matrix came out late last year Early this year, uh, Keanu Reeves, if you didn't know, is, is part uh, uh, Hawaiian, so he's Pacific Islander. Uh, NCIS Hawaii is our favorite show right now on TV. It, it stars uh, a Filipina and a, a New Zealander who uh, sounds like he could totally be native Hawaiian, uh, a, an Arab American and uh and a couple of white guys too and uh it's really of all the ncis shows and i got tired of all of them this is one that i watch every week because it's the plots are really interesting and the characters are really fully developed uh for december 7th last year they had a fascinating plot about a um a japanese illegal immigrant who uh snuck into hawaii and was working. He, he was not a terrorist. He was working 
when Pearl Harbor got bombed, and the story un, kind of folded unfolded from there. Boba Fett has uh, uh, another yet another movie with Ming Na Wen, who was the voice, by the way, of Mulan. Uh, you know, the first Mulan, and uh, she she's had a long run with Agents of Shield, and she's kind of a badass. And on Boba Fett, she is this kind of very uh, stony-faced handler uh, who goes after bad guys. And this, I, I wanted to show this just because Shang-Chi uh, and The Legend of the Ten Rings was the number one box office film of 2021. It made more money last year than any other movie. Granted, it was a pandemic year and uh, Hollywood was just starting to figure out how to balance streaming with theater, uh, theatrical release, but it made a 432 million. Now, having said that, the new Tom Cruise movie that just opened uh, made a hundred million <laughs> over the Memorial Day weekend. So, hey, you know, things have changed. Uh, at the same time, Michelle Yeoh is everywhere, right? She is everything, everywhere, all at once, uh, a very, um, trippy i guess is the word um film but she is everywhere because she's been in um she's in shang chi she's been in like five different movies that i've shown in this presentation uh she's played in star trek uh she is just amazing um so i think she needs to get a lifetime achievement award because she has been uh, a presence, an Asian American woman presence in Hollywood for several decades now, and she's fantastic. And then there's a brand new animated series called Samurai Rabbit, again on Netflix, sorry, uh, based on a series of comic books drawn by a Japanese American artist named Stan Sakai. He's been drawing these for what, tw more than 25 years? Uh, the uh, the comics are called Usagi Yojimbo, and it's very loosely based on uh, the historical uh, character uh, of a samurai back in the uh, uh, medieval days of Japan. And this is a TV version that is the great grandson or descendant of the Usagi Yojimbo rabbit. Usagi means rabbit. And Yojimbo is a famous uh, uh, samurai movie from the 60s. But um, this Netflix show takes place in kind of a futuristic Tokyo. I think it's called Neo Tokyo. And Samurai Rabbit is Yojimbo, uh, Yojimbo's descendant as a, as a rabbit. And all his friends are familiar Japanese kind of myth characters, mythological characters. And there's a ton of very authentic references to Japanese culture and history in this series. I can't believe that Stan Sakai got away with doing that and putting it into a Netflix series that is appealing to young people because uh, it's a cool, fun action thing. And they're, these characters are taking selfies of themselves um, all over the place. And it's, a, it's very smart and very connected to Japanese culture. And I think it's brilliant. Um, here, coming soon, I started this presentation with Anna Mae Wong. She's actually, uh, actually getting a quarter uh, with her face on it. And uh, I think it might already be out, but I haven't seen any yet. And I need to go to, I guess, a bank or someplace to get some. Uh, I just think it's great that Anna Mae Wong, who left the United States because of a lack of roles. By the way, she came back to the U.S. in the 1950s and was the first Asian American to have a TV show. It only lasted one season, but she had a TV show um, that she produced and wrote and starred in. So um, she deserves the... Uh, um, Hollywood Walk of Fame star that she got. And then one last reference here, uh, just a couple of weeks ago on May 10th, 
James Hong, who you probably would recognize if you, you know, watch a lot of movies that happen to have Asians in them. Sometimes he plays a bad guy. Sometimes he plays a grandpa. Sometimes, sometimes he plays a dad. Uh, he's he's 92 now, and they gave him a, Holly, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So very cool. And then I just want to admit that the ultimate Asian movie star is not James Hong, is not Anna Mae Wong or Seshi Hayakawa or even Simu Liu from Shang-Chi. It's Godzilla. In Japan, he's called Gojira, which is a combination of gorilla and, um, and whale. And uh, he's done 36 movies. He starred in 36 movies. Okay, the earlier ones were with like a guy in a rubber suit. And the more recent ones are really scary CGI computer animated things. But um, it's cool that you show this photo, for instance, or any photo of Godzilla to anybody in the world, and they'll immediately know who it is and or what it is. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, oh, we're a little bit over. Um, I knew I would be. I tried to go fast. I'm so sorry. This is my blog. It's called The Nikkei View. I write about things like uh, a Colorado photographer who went to Kyoto and uh, took a, an amazing bunch of photographs that were on display here in Denver a couple months ago. Uh, the pilgrimage to Amachi, the Japanese American concentration camp. Uh, in Southeast Colorado was just held over this weekend, Memorial Day, uh, two weekends ago, sorry, the week before Memorial Day. And uh, it's, it's a very moving pilgrimage every year. And now this year was special because it's going to be a national park. Uh, and then there's, uh, this is my most recent blog post. I went to my local grocery store and found uh, some Japanese style peanuts made by a Mexican company, and it just uh, had a stereotypical illustration of a Japanese geisha on the, on the package, and it really bugged me. So I wrote about all the stereotypical packages uh, that have been in our consciousness all our lives, you know, especially if you're my age. Things like Aunt Jemima, Mrs. Butterworth, uh, Land of Lakes, the, you know, indigenous woman kneeling and serving you a thing of butter. So um, I uh, just had to get that out of my system and write about that. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. And um, let's go to questions. Are there questions that I can answer? Yeah, uh, that was great. Thank you so much. So well-rounded. Um, and you brought up some of the shows that I've really enjoyed and have wondered <laughs> about. Like I my whole family loves The Last Airbender, and we were so disappointed by the movie. <laughs> yeah, so, people hated that movie. Oh, and, my God, it was terrible. It, it was done by an Asian-American producer, right, director, M. Night Shyamalan, mm -hmm. He's South Asian. And it's like, how could you do that, dude? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we definitely felt like that. Um, and we're very excited about the new one um, yeah. and hope that they do it justice because the, the show was just adorable. Um, and, and it really felt like it was that whole rounded South Asian, you know, culture thing. And everybody was into it. And it was like the show on Nickelodeon. Um, I'm going to read some comments and stuff. Mm -hmm. If there's a long question in the Q&A, if you don't mind pulling that up and seeing if there's aspects okay. of it that you can answer. Um, but some of the comments, um, Mona said that she wanted to add the opera Luck May to the list that you had of... Um, Oh. I think you were talking about uh, the opera and the Miss Saigon. And, and yeah. Yeah. And Rebecca asks if you've seen The World According to Susie Wong. You know, I actually have not seen that. Okay. But uh, I know the actress who played in it was, a, is, was a very prominent Asian American actress. And, um, the, okay, so... Here's, here's how I fall on things like why some stereotypes are offensive while others aren't. Mm -hmm. I think in the end, we all need to think about uh, how ethnicities are presented. Mm 
Mm -hmm. I just want to um, say this is oh, this is from the question from the Q and A that um, right. that Gil's responding to right now. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the world of Susie Wong it kind of relates to that in that um, I think there are pieces of American pop culture that are of a time. Now there there's always that that red line or whatever line it is where it gets offensive. So like Disney is a good example. Song of the South it's no longer acceptable because it shows a bunch of post-slavery African-Americans being all happy and singing, oh, what, a, you know, singing about the South and what, how great it is. And it just doesn't fit the reality anymore. Uh, I think things like um, Chinese accent, it's one thing for my mom to speak funny with a Japanese accent, it bugs me if somebody who's not Japanese talks to me that way. Like I grew up, I grew up like I, I think with like a lot of Asian Americans with people going, coming up to me and saying, ching chong, ching chong, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and like showing me their buck teeth and pulling back their eyes. And uh, that bugged me. And so when I hear stereotypes of that, I think that it's the, um, uh, it's an echo of hearing that growing up. Also every December 7th growing up, e even after I moved to the US, actually only after, never heard it in Japan, uh, you know, where I went to school on army bases and had a very bicultural upbringing. Once we moved to the US, Every December 7th, I would hear, um, you know, go back, go back to where you came from, you dirty, sneaky Jap. Remember Pearl Harbor. And to me, those things really cut deep. So when celebrities like, uh, um, uh, like basketball players or uh, famous singers speak in a ching chongy voice, uh, to me, it's not only disrespectful, it comes from a place where they think that Asians are lesser and okay to make fun of. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that's why it, it bugs me. And I think the definition of offensive is, is definitely up to everybody's, you know, personal barometer. Um, like, you know, uh, if a non-Hispanic actor portrays a Spanish-speaking character, speaks with an accent and says, hola, the one thinks it's offensive. I actually do. Uh, you know, I've done enough learning about this whole history that America has. You know, that when I, I grew up with the Lone Ranger and Jay Silverheels was Tonto, his Native American sidekick. And he... Jay, good for Jay Hill, Silverheels. He was a, a, a pretty good actor and he had a great role. But all the other Asians in TV shows and movies for decades, I mean, not Asians, Indians, Native Americans, indigenous people, they were like, maybe they were maybe Latino, maybe they were, I doubt they were Native. Uh, they were usually white actors with brown face. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember I, um, I interviewed a Native American actor once who won an, an Oscar about that. And he had a lot to say about uh, the status of, of Native Americans in Hollywood. Um, mm -hmm. So in my article, my blog post about I'm so disappointed to see stereotype snack packaging in my supermarket, I talk, I sh I talk about and I show the, a picture of uh, the Frito Bandito who was, when I was a kid, Fritos were marketed, you know, with this character in a sombrero and, you know, ban bandoleros and, and he would steal your Fritos or hold you up at gunpoint and say, give me your Fritos, mm. you know, and he had, a, he had that accent and they even had the song, the famous Mexican folk song, they turned it into a, a Frito song. Ay, 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 I am the Frito Bandito. And it's amazing to me that I grew up in that and never really thought about it. And now 
when I think about it, it uh, it just really shakes me. Mm -hmm. so, uh, this is an interesting one. What about the Harold and Kumar movies? Uh, <laughs> I think they're they make fun of you know stoners more than anything else, and I've known a lot of people like that. Uh, and Kumar in the movies, it's interesting because he he has that um, he has that push and pull of of his cultural, you know, uh, uh, roots and traditions and values that are like, this is wrong. And, but then he's still, you know, he's, he's a stoner. <laughs> uh, so I, I find that interesting. I don't find it offensive, but you know what? I haven't seen them in probably 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. I should go back and watch all of them again and see what, how I feel. Uh, miniseries Shogun from the 1970s, it, a lot of it was accurate. There was a British um, sailor, uh, pilot, navigator who was shipwrecked. And um, it wasn't quite like that where he was, he became a full-blown samurai and, and was uh, part of the uh, uh, shogunate who took over and, and unified Japan. But there were elements of history in in that uh, in that both in the book Shogun and the miniseries and you know what I, I read the book and I watched the miniseries I have the miniseries on <laughs> video on DVD and um, what I like about it is that it captured Japanese culture of the time quite accurately uh, even if the plot line was weird and um, and a little unbelievable um, but it was uh it captured the time pretty well even like uh the last samurai kind of a stupid movie tom cruise you make a lousy samurai you know um i i like the story a bit you know a disillusioned civil war veteran goes to japan and eventually becomes like you know a samurai <laughs> but the fact that he could hole up in a Japanese village in the mountains for one winter and, and learn all the subtleties of being a samurai sword fighter. Nah, doesn't happen like that. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't there a very recent movie with Matt Damon? And that was really like, yeah, about the great wall. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was, that was more fantasy than anything else. The, the great wall exists, but, um, but, and and frankly, there were kind of European uh, traders who traveled the Silk Road to Mongolia, China, which was run by Mongolians at the time. And um, and that there's a basis of truth, but you know, dragons coming to life and stuff, nah. <laughs> but you know, I love watching those things. I, I love watching like Shang Chi. Yeah, dragon comes to life, and I totally believe it because it's the Marvel Comics universe. Come That's on, right. <laughs> <You know. laughs> Sally says that they Dave Patel should deserves a mention, which I agree. And I think we have yeah. time for just this one last question. Um, Jahavi asked earlier, "What do you think about current depictions of foreign Asians versus Asian Americans in Hollywood? Does Orientalism or other stereotypes of foreign Asians still impact Asian Americans and their portrayal in American-made art?" That's an interesting question. I don't know that I'm qualified to speak definitively definitively about that. Um, you know, there are, there are always films that that refer to um, like a a wedding in India or uh, yakuza in Japan that are, you know come to the U.S. or Americans go to Japan and get caught up in the in the storyline and um, I think, I think at this point, my or in Hawkeye, for instance, or in the in the Avengers series, um, there is that sense of, you know, Hawkeye goes rogue and goes to Japan, and and there's always some there's things that happen, and all I ask is that the cultures are just presented authentically and not as like phony i just want and 
you know, you can tell if there's been some thought put into depicting Japan of today mm -hmm. or Singapore or Hong Kong. Um, the world is much smaller now because of social media, because of the internet. People kind of know when something's totally bogus and fake. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think it, it's become harder to do something that blatant, um, mm -hmm. like the Mikado. That's why the Mikado just needs to go away. <laughs> but um, but uh, I, I'm okay with saying cancel the Mikado, please. But I, I think anymore, it's hard to pull off something you know, total fakery that you have to have some respect uh, anybody who writes a story, who films a story, who directs a story or acts in a story, you got to have some respect for the culture that it's depicting, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and just as a last comment, I don't know if you watch Bridgerton, but they <laughs> cast, you know, two South, a three South Asian women yeah. as yeah. main characters. And it was huge. And, um, you know, but then people started picking at the, the little, um, idiosyncrasies and yeah. um you know because that's what that's you know that's our lived experience right right now i i think that's that's legit that if you're going to do that and um i, I shouldn't do this but what's the woman who did bridgerton uh um, the books uh simone ashley no, no the director the oh producer. shonda rhimes shonda rhimes I wrote a blog post, I don't know, about 10 years ago, why I stopped watching um, Grey's Anatomy mm. uh, and some of her and all her other films, actually, because she seemed to have this thing where she would not, she would show African Americans, which is great. She wouldn't show Asians. Mm. Seattle Grey is a hospital in Seattle, and we hardly ever even saw any Asian patients there never mind any staff nurses or anybody else uh, you watch a show like the good doctor which is on now takes place in san jose half the staff a lot of the, uh, the you know the patients the people in the hospital um, it's shown very realistically the population of san jose and uh and it just started to bug me that mm -hmm. shonda rhymes seem to have a blind side about Asians. And that's, you know, yeah, Sandra Oh was in there, but her character was hardly ever acknowledged as an Asian American. Mm -hmm. In two episodes that I can remember, she referenced her Korean upbringing. That was it. And, um, and then her other movies, uh, TV shows like uh, uh, what is it? How to get away with the perfect murder or whatever? Uh, they just didn't. They didn't. They didn't feel inclusive to me. They felt inclusive of her, and I, you know, she's African American. She that she has every right to to do whatever she wants. But um, yeah, I wrote a blog post, and it it bugged me enough. And so I watched that first season of Bridgerton. Um, and I thought it was interesting, but really weird and not believable at all to me. And um, and then the second season, I kind of tangentially watched my wife, you know, binged it. <laughs> but and I thought it was cool that she decided to bring South Asians into it. Mm -hmm. But there's a there the, the whole setup to me feels weird. Mm. Well, that's good to know. Um, well, that's just me, though. Yep. <laughs> so thank you so much for this. This is really fascinating. And I know in the comments, I've been hearing about how much people are enjoying this oh, as well. Um, and as I told people in the chat, we will post this on our YouTube channel for one month and um, you're welcome to watch it and share it and enjoy it for that amount of time. And um, Gil, just thank you. This is really wonderful. I appreciate oh, you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. I had a lot of fun. Appreciate Good. the time. <laughs> well, thanks again to all the libraries that participated, as well as the Friends of the Library, and I hope you all have a wonderful night. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.